Here we're going to consider the harmonic oscillator, in particular the uh, classical description of a harmonic oscillator. That's the way we usually work in quantum mechanics. We look at a system uh, classically and then we make the appropriate changes and consider it quantum mechanically. So harmonic oscillator, you may remember this from introductory physics, but if not, let's review it now. This is an experiment you may have done in introductory physics. You have a stand and on the stand, on this arm here, you have a spring and then attached to the spring is a mass. This is a spring. And then you let the uh, mass just come equilibrium, it just sort of sits there. Then what you did probably was to move this mass down this way and as you move the mass what happened is that you have a force going up the other way, a restoring force and you move the spring down further and the force increases and so on. And so what you probably developed is Hooke's law F equal minus KX. And again X here is the distance going up and down. Normally you have X in this direction, we flipped it so X is going up and down this way. And if you find that the force going in the opposite direction is X, that you're pulling the spring, that force is proportional to the uh, distance you stretch the spring then you have what's called Hooke's Law and this would be called a Hooke's Law spring and K would be the spring a constant or sometimes called the force constant. Experimentally you find that this is um, a Hooke's Law. So you find F equals minus KX and if to get the potential because we're eventually going to put this in the Schrodinger equation and the Hamiltonian you need the potential and the kinetic energy so from this force you can get the potential the potential is defined as a minus the integral of force dx so it'll be minus the integral of minus kx dx and that's equal to one-half k x squared. So there's a potential of a classical harmonic oscillator spring that obeys Hooke's law. Now what we want is to determine, and we're going to use Newton's second law, what we want to do, do is to determine how x varies with time. Okay, so x. How does x, this distance here, vary with time? Once, say, you pull down the spring and then release it. You know, boing, 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 boing. Can you describe how the position x varies with time? The answer is yes. That's where you use Newton's second law. Force minus kx is equal to the second derivative of x with respect to time. That's acceleration. So you have a second order differential equation, x, uh, with time. And you can figure out by uh, solving the differential equation how x varies with time. Let's go ahead and reproduce that equation here. Minus kx is equal to mass times acceleration, which is the second derivative of x with respect to time. Let's rewrite this a little bit so maybe it'll become uh, familiar to you from our previous studies here. Second derivative of x is equal to minus k over m times x. This you may recognize from our study of differential equations right before we talked about particle in a box is a second order linear homogeneous equation, a differential equation. So we can immediately write down the solution to this x of t is equal to a e to the minus i square root of k over m t. Now t is a, uh, the independent variable here plus b e to the i square root of k over m t. Okay, well let's use Euler's relation to, uh, just to refresh your memory, Euler relation e to the say i, um, let's use some uh, say a x, or in this case it would be t, so that's our independent variable, so I'm going to just go ahead and use t there. That's equal to cosine of a t plus i sine of a t. So with Euler's relation we can rewrite x of t 
is C cosine of square root of K over M T plus D sine of square root of K over M T. I'm going to make a, a substitution here, use a different symbol. I'm going to call square root of k over m uh, square root uh, uh, omega and uh, call this omega. Now omega, if you look at the units here, uh, the force constant, well, uh, the force constant k has units of force divided by distance, cancel out all the um, uh, distances and masses you're left with a second squared and so square root would be seconds so Omega has units of sorry inverse seconds inverse seconds well Omega will be a frequency we can uh, look at this expression here to determine that yeah square root of K over M has units of inverse frequency or inverse time say because when you take the cosine of something that has to be unitless t has units of say seconds so therefore square root of k over m must have units of inverse seconds so that's a frequency so let's rewrite that in this new notation c cosine of omega t plus d sine of omega t now i claim that this can be rewritten as let's see we used a b c d well <laughs> let's use this coefficient e times the sine of omega t plus an angle and this is called the phase angle so I claim by varying the phase angle you can incorporate cosine and sine at different proportions why is that well, remember from introductory trigonometry, the sine of some angle alpha plus 90 is a cosine of that angle. And here the face angle would be 90. Okay, let's show that graphically. Here we're going to draw the sine and cosine waves. So here's the sine, it goes up and then it goes down, and it goes down like this. This is a sine wave. And this is uh, time on this axis, and this is x of time. Uh, the position is a function of time. And sine starts at zero, at zero. It reaches a maximum at uh, angle pi over two, 90 degrees and reaches zero again at pi. Let's look at the um, cosine. Cosine starts at one, it goes through zero there and reaches a, a negative max, a maximum negative number here at pi. So this would be cosine. Now maybe you can see this, if you shift the sine wave this way by pi over two, go from pi over three to 90, by 90 degrees, you reproduce a cosine or if you take the cosine and shift it plus 90 degrees over here you reproduce a sine so sine and cosine differ by shifting on this axis and that is called the phase angle in fact by shifting any arbitrary angle you can incorporate either pure sine or pure cos a pure sine or a pure cosine wave or anything in between so you can capture both the sine and the cosine by introducing this phase angle phi. The phase angle could be any uh, thing between 0 and 360 or actually could be any multiple of any number, um, any angle. Okay, so there is the solution for the uh, classical harmonic oscillator in general form written as uh, it is in most introductory physics texts. Well, let's just see what that looks like. So we're going to put x of t. We're going to plot that function there. And again, the function we're going to plot is x of t is some amplitude, or what do we use? E, A, B, C, D, E. <laughs> Sorry. I'm getting my symbols a little mixed up here. 
but it'd be e times a uh, sine we said sine of omega t plus a face angle phi let's give some initial conditions say a time equals zero let's make the position to be equal to zero what does that correspond to well in this spring here uh, let's say this equilibrium position here is x equals zero so when you don't pull the spring so if you push it up here x is positive if you pull it down here x is negative so let's just say um, initially this spring is right here at zero so we pulled it down we let it go and we start our clock right here when it hits zero all right now the x goes increases the function of time okay so x increases the function of time we're just plotting this function right here so what about that phase angle well this implies that the phase angle here is equal to zero because when time is equal to zero sine is equal to zero so the phase angle has to be zero so we have a zero phase angle sine wave or just a regular sine wave goes up reaches the maximum reaches the maximum when it goes as far up as it can and then it starts to go back down passes through zero and goes down here to a, a negative maximum goes down here negative goes through zero again and so on keeps oscillating there so that is a plot of how x varies with time when the phase angle is equal to zero now you could have started the spring or started your stopwatch when uh, it reaches the maximum so in that case when x is equal to zero or when time sorry when time is equal to zero that's the maximum so when time is equal to zero the maximum what you've done is shifted your zero time over here to pi over two all right well that's probably more than you want to uh, know but that is um, what uh, the solution to the uh, uh, the classical harmonic oscillator problem is now before we end this lecture let me say a little bit about what this is here this frequency okay so omega so omega is frequency and the units here are radian per second radian per second now perhaps you're more familiar with uh, frequency in terms of cycles per second okay so this is frequency in cycles per second that's given the Greek symbol nu whereas this is given the Greek symbol Omega now how do you uh, convert from frequency in radian per second to frequency in cycles per second well in one as you may know in 360 degrees that's one cycle that is equal to 2 pi radian so 2 pi radian per cycle times the frequency in cycles per second that will give you the frequency omega in radian per second so the relationship between those two units 2 pi nu is equal to omega I prefer using omega if you don't use omega then what you have to do in all these solutions is to put 2 pi times nu or um, in, in this you have uh, 2 pi nu and so on okay so why not use omega and you don't have to carry around that 2 pi but anyway just to be uh, some textbook I think uh, ball textbook uses frequency in cycles per second a lot and I will be using exclusively almost exclusively frequency in Omega radian per second all right just a sidelight all right so now uh, when, now that we know classically how an harmonic oscillator um, works uh, let's do that quantum mechanically